Thanks everyone. I'd like to give a very, very warm welcome to the two leading lights who have joined us. We have Monica McWilliams, who is a professor of women's studies, but that's only the start. <laughs> <laughs> she is, I believe, one of only two women who were part of the inter-party talks leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. She's also a long-time peace activist and a human rights activist, and it's great to have her with us. And also wonderful to have Hasina Safi, who is a former Minister of Women's Affairs from Afghanistan, a long-time human rights activist, a civil society activist, and a women's rights activist, and all of that in a country where, as we know, it is extremely difficult to champion the rights of women. This question is, is for both of you, and I'll start, if I can, with you, Hasina. Okay. When women are excluded and marginalized in peace processes, how can they overcome those barriers to try and have their voices heard at the table? Thank you very much, first, for having me in the panel. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be with both of you. Uh, the first uh, reply or response to this question would be, at 2023, we should not even imagine putting the word excluded uh, within the peace process for women. So I do not agree with this question that women should not be uh, um, excluded. Women must be included, women must be included, women must be included. And Peace has no meaning when it comes to absence of women. And I think we had the first two sessions where we saw the examples of Sudan. We heard about it and also Colombia about the process. And still, we all as intellectuals, as higher education students, we know what is still going on. However, since I have to respond to this, there are many local initiatives which has been going on for centuries, for many decades. So at that time, we need to use the local structures in order to pass our message and to voice out the messages. But I will end up again that we should not think about exclusion of women on the table. The women must be on the table, the women must represent themselves by themselves. The women must define their issues themselves. Monica, what would you say? I, I, know that, I know that here in Northern Ireland, it has been a struggle at times for women to be acknowledged for the role that they have played. Is that something that's still a struggle here now? It's not so much a struggle nor, now, Orla, but it still is compared to what it was like 25 years ago. In fact, when you're an outsider and you manage to become an insider, there's a lot of pushback, as the women in Afghanistan absolutely know. And there was a lot of misogyny, a lot of sexism, and that's raw when it's combined with sectarianism. And women here were very reluctant to get into mainstream politics because they were much more productive on the front line, at the interfaces, crossing over the peace lines. Um, and they learned from that how to bring a more nuanced understanding of the causes of the conflict. Um, in fact, I just heard a strap line um, when I launched this beautiful program, a bit like this program here, of 25 at 25, which was 25, the 25th anniversary this year, which is great that you're here to celebrate it, um, of 25 leaders for the next 25 years. Um, and it reminds me of that last session, which is, we inherit our history, we choose our future. And that's what women were saying for years here when they got involved in the peace negotiations. We managed to get elected. It was a unique context, and we got to the table. But it's what women brought to the table. It wasn't just the inclusive process. You heard earlier about the need for dialogue. And that's not easy when people are opponents or enemies um, because they only want to dialogue with their own side. So what women were doing was crossing over 
and engaging in that dialogue with the people that the men felt that they couldn't do it. So they, we brought that process to the peace talks and brought the substance of what wouldn't be on the table. The stuff that we could see was segregated communities, the absolute segregated nature of education, the importance of shared housing, the importance of what you're here today, the importance of emerging leaders for the future. That's all in our Good Friday Agreement. It's in the chapter on reconciliation, along with reparations for victims, which if women hadn't been at the table, that would not have been there. Um, the Civic Forum, we came from civic society. We understood the importance of civil representatives sitting down with political representatives and having that kind of dialogue. That's how you sustain peace. But you know what I learned and what we've learned from Afghanistan and other countries is that when the peace is made, the women are told, okay, move over now, we will share power and we won't establish the things that you've put into the peace agreement because all those things can wait. And that's where we failed. And that's why we're in the state that we're currently in. Hasina, looking at the situation in Afghanistan, your home country from which sadly now you are in, in exile, we've seen a huge reversal of, of human rights and especially for women since the return of the Taliban to power. Do you see a real chance that girls will be allowed back to secondary school and that young women will be allowed back to universities? Because so far there has just been this stubborn, well actually not a refusal, a statement that it will be done but it doesn't happen. There's been no progress. Do you, do you, think, do you see a chance? Um, as, as an activist, as a human rights activist, I see. I see it because the day I stop seeing that, it means it's the end of the world for me because I have to struggle for the objective that I'm living for. And that is, the objective is to provide for our coming generations a life, a dignified life, which they deserve as girls. Now, the chance, I'm an exile. I see the chance, I dream about the chance, but it will not happen itself. It needs a lot of real measures to be taken. There is a lot of advocacy which is going on. Majority of the women activists, majority of the peace builders, majority of especially the women population who were a part of all this struggle, they have scattered around the world. Though sometimes their mentalities are different, their ideology is different, but it, when it comes to the participation of women, when it comes to education, there is one vision. So how I see the hope is that I feel as a human being in the world, at this time I see myself as a human being. I see Afghanistan as a part of the global body. That is why I see a chance. And the chance is with the international communities more being considerate and thoughtful and also putting themselves in the place of Afghan women if the education would have been stopped on them, on their daughters, on their wives, what would the situation be? I see the chance, but I need a lot of decision makers. I need a lot of those who are just saying that this is an internal affairs of Afghanistan. Not to say that this is an internal affairs, because if it is an, an internal affairs, why are they supporting Afghanistan? Education is human building. Education is personality building. So that is a future human resource investment, not only for Afghanistan, but for the whole world. So that is how I see a chance, but I see this chance outside Afghanistan, not inside Afghanistan. And I propose that the global world, the international community, needs to very analytically and considerately discuss with the present de facto structure. What is the reason that they are prohibiting girls from schools and from social mobilization?
Monica, I mentioned earlier that you were one of the few women taking part in the talks before the agreement, and I read you said, we felt like outsiders in the first year, we received a great deal of insults, go home to the kitchen, go and breed for the country and have babies. I mean, it, it, it's astonishing to think that that was said. And how did you keep going? Well, I guess um, I had to realize this was more about them than it was about us. We built, and I would say this to you, build a strong team. No one does this alone. Um, and change comes around mostly through a collective effort. We had a good movement, a social movement that happened to turn into a political party, a women's party. Um, and we felt that there was the learning that came from that was to help each other, even when you fall down. There's an African proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. And so you learn as much from that process I had to put on a kind of armor every Friday morning. There was a forum called the Forum for Dialogue and Understanding. And I tell this often that we renamed it the Forum for Monologue and Misunderstanding <laughs> because everybody was talking to themselves. Um, and there was absolutely no dialogue. Um, and what we women did was went behind the scenes and began to open up the back channels to the groups that you heard earlier about, to the paramilitaries, to the armed groups. But we had certain principles. And you asked the question about um, who do you talk to with men with guns. Um, and we said there are principles. We will work as hard for you to come into the room as you must work to get into that room. And that's the kind of message that we constantly brought or that we had to remember there were bigger stakes than just the insults. And misogyny hurts more than women. Um, xenophobia hurts more than immigrants. Racism hurts more the, than people of color. So this was the point we were making. And, you know, we had to overcome that hatred. And I felt that hatred. And it did take your toll on you. Um, but I went home to children, as mothers do. And I remember my young son, and he was more interested that uh, the footballer who was here this morning than he was about the fact that we were here this morning. Um, and that he was saying to me, Mum, it's terrible uh, that they're calling, telling you to shut up and sit down or that you're a silly woman. Hence the reason why I wrote the book, Stand Up and Speak Out. But then he turned to me on a very bright night and he was being put to bed very early. Um, and he said, you know, Mum, I don't believe what they're saying to you, but you're a very silly woman because you're putting me to bed too soon when I could be out playing. <laughs> and that was reality, Orla. It was coming home to that, mm. having a good support network around you, having the rocks that you could rely on to, to keep you through it. And that's my message to the One Young World uh, movement, is find those rocks, find them amongst yourselves, and you have this most wonderful opportunity of finding them across with the exchanges that you've made this week, and stay in touch because you will learn so much from each other, as I did from the women in Colombia, and as I did when we met with the women of Afghanistan. They were my rocks, and they gave me the kind of armor to put on and go back in um, and face often the laughter of the men who were bonding together in that misogyny. Um, and it was a pretty rough place to be. But every time they told me to go home and stand by the men of Ulster, we got up and sang, stand by your men. So good humor <laughs> is another good tool to have in your box. Great. <laughs> I'm extremely sorry to say that we're, we're close to running out of time. So, Hasina, I'll, I'll ask you actually for your advice. I wanted to ask you both because we have a room full of, of young leaders here. You've both walked a very hard path and, and in very different circumstances. And I know the struggle is still very much ongoing for you, Hasina. What would you say to, to the young generation who are here with us? What do they need to do? What advice would you give them? The first thing I tell them is never give up. Never give up. Don't think you will fail. Be very firm and dedicated. And believe in the good part of the world, like one young world, like your own network. So that is how you can get to where you are. Believe in yourself. Never give up. Get, be firm with your objectives 
and no matter how hardship you see, just be consistent and continuous and believe in the good part of the world, in the good group of human beings, the rocks. That is what my message would be. Well, what a lovely note to end on. And we, we certainly have two, two rocks here, if I can put it that way. Um, it's been wonderful to hear from you both about the, the very different paths that you've been on, but also about the, the similarities and, and the great solidarity that there is to be found uh, when you find a, a, supportive, a supportive group. And wishing you both well with your continuing work. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we go? That was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can all escape there. <laughs>